So, so Roger, this, this actually brings us to a very nice little intersection where I would like to segue back to uh, one of your favorite specialities, and those are the mud fossils and the fossils, ancient civilizations, floods, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Which it's, it's, it's a wormhole, man. You just never end. It never ends. But that's what I think people love you for that. And, and you really became highly loved and regarded because of your work and your discoveries in mud fossils. And you're the guy that got me started. And you're the guy that got me to recognize my mud fossils here that then led to this explosion of finding fossils everywhere. Now my museum is overflowing with fossils. I've stopped picking them up because there's just too many. Wherever they're, you, they're everywhere. They're, they're everywhere. everywhere. They literally are everywhere. They're everywhere. But just once you... Let me tell you something. I got to tell you something. You say I, I started you. Here's the deal. When I first found my giants, and I mean giants, you know the size of the giants I found, and they're on my property and they're DNA tested. There's no... And I'll show you some of this stuff. But... When I started looking up, you're the guy, the only guy I could find that was talking about giants. You're standing in front of that big footprint, and it had some little coins or something in the bottom of it. And you're standing there pointing to it. Now, I don't know what you were thinking at that point, but I said, that's a footprint. And that's a puppy. That's, that little, that's a little tiny guy. Yeah, that's a, those are the little guys. Those are the 10-meter giants. Yeah, that's a little guy. Oh, that's tiny. Those are the, the small guys. Yard, the one in my backyard here, just the fingertip is three feet long, a fingertip, <laughs> and that's DNA tested, and it has, still has the fingernail and fingerprints on it. Yeah. Did you see beautiful. that? Yeah, you know, my, uh, that, that little, that little, um, that stone that I carried with me the last uh, two years when I went on tour to America before lockdown, and uh, and I had the uh, and and um, I I thought it was the is it was the first part of, of a finger that this this section here, um, yeah. this section here, and then um, and then I was up at at um, my friend's place um, <clears throat> in in Washington Washington State, and um, <clears throat> and there was a um, uh, a remote viewer there that you know does remote viewing. It teaches remote viewing. And again, there are people that don't know what remote viewing is. Go away and research remote viewing. There's actually a fantastic documentary free on YouTube. I think it's probably like a year or two years old. It's called Third Eye Spies. Third Eye Spies. And it's narrated and starred, the star of this documentary. It's really well done. Like it, It's like a feature movie documentary. I think it's two hours long. Is the guy that started the, the remote viewing program at... Um, God, one of the, Boston, one of those universities on the East Coast in the 70s for the military. Uh, and it became a CIA project and it was, it was huge. And how the Russians and the Americans used to spy on each other with remote viewers. And this was highly secretive. And then they realized that, wow, if we know what they're doing, then they know what we're doing. That means there are no more secrets. <laughs> so, and this documentary is unbelievable. You know, and people still think, oh, remote viewing is some hocus pocus, mumbo jumbo, new age crap. No, this is highly sophisticated, highly researched, scientific uh, confirmation that we have extrasensory ability and capacity. It's just been suppressed because our DNA has been messed with. And we don't have those abilities anymore until we focus our energies, focus our thoughts, focus our minds. And we start to reactivate those aspects of our own capacity and our own abilities. Remember, our DNA has infinite capacity. It's just how it's structured, how it's coded. We can code our DNA to bloody do anything, right? So, again, these are really important considerations that most people just don't know because they don't have enough information or knowledge to be able to structure those thoughts. So, anyway, I was, I've gone on a tangent here. So, I was up there in, um, in Washington State um, and uh, at the Eseti Ranch. Um, and um, and there was this guy that does remote viewing, and he said, would you like me to remote view the stone for you? And I said, yes, please. So I held it up, and he just took a picture of it, and he sent an email to his 12 remote viewers around the world, his 12 students around the world. They don't know each other. And this is the email that he sent. He said, please remote view this object. He didn't say it was a stone. He didn't say we think it's a giant. He didn't say anything. All he said Please remote view this object. 
12 hours later at breakfast, it was one afternoon, the next morning at breakfast, we are, stay, we are standing around a fire. And, uh, and he comes out and I said, do you have any feedback? And he said, yes. Uh, they've all come back uh, with pretty much the same answer, except one. Uh, all of them say it is, the, it is the, the front part of a small toe of a giant. So it's that part of a small toe of a giant. And the one, the, the, the odd one out came back. It's either the, the front part of a, of a pinky of a giant or a small toe of a giant. And they explained how the giant died. It was in battle. It was killed and so forth. They went into detail how the giant died. So the 12 individuals that don't know each other, they've never seen each other. They, they observed and remote viewed that object, which is a stone, a, a fossil of, of this giant. So what we now have is empirical scientific proof that that is the front part of a small toe of a giant because statistical prob probability simply does not allow for any other conclusion that 12 people around the world reach the same conclusion that and therefore this is what they say it is. And so I'll just love that little experience, uh, which, uh, which you know, gives us all these things, you know, you know that I study all of the ancient texts and uh, you know Ovid was metamorphosis they could transform themselves they could morph they could turn into birds and and and, and plants and fungus and anything they wanted to these these gods that apparently came down took over the earth and just had their ball and they could transform themselves into from either what they were dragons maybe i don't know there's dragons everywhere so whether they were dragons, I don't know, but they could make themselves into like really every one of them looks like a, a male model. And, and, and they just had their blast with women. And they said, these women look hot. Let's just go down there and have a fun. And they, they did. And they, they corrupted the earth. And then and it gets pretty deep, but so, I go so, to the deepest part of the ancient text, which is Apollodorus. If you want to read anything that talks about Earth, how Earth was actually formed, and the ocean was the first thing to take over, and then Earth and ended up Earth had intercourse with Tartarus, which is hell and brought forth Typhon, which is the dragon in the desert. What and that dragon is exactly what it says in Apollodorus 1.6, if you want to look at it. Apollodorus okay. 1.6. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. No, no, that, that, this, this is really important for us to study all these ancient texts, and some of them make more sense to us than others, because you know our brains can only comprehend so much, and we block out things that we can't relate to. That's what we just naturally do. But the exciting thing is that the more information you have, the more knowledge you gain, the more open you are to new information. So when you start out, you like this little puppy and you, you can't, the stuff doesn't make any sense because you, you don't comprehend it. You can't, you can't plug it in anyway. So you can't process that information. But the more, the more you grow, the more knowledge you have, the more information you have, the easier it is to plug bits of information into your expanding body of knowledge. And that's what I find so fascinating. I'm now open to much more information than I was five years ago. And, you know, and, and even more so than I was 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, so one of my. Let me ask you something, you know, Michael, Michael, I got to, <laughs> I got to ask you this. How are you, you're open to everything. Now, let me ask you what you think moons are made out of. I have no idea. I must tell you, Roger, the whole, the whole discussion and the whole story of the cosmos, our Earth, its shape, it's a very sensitive subject, but it's a subject that needs to be discussed. The moon I, absolutely, absolutely. What, what, you you know all the stories. Every, every culture talks about bodies of the gods being turned into planets and moons and moons like iapetus that michael yeah. is a tendon ball or and our moon is too and all the moons are and i could show, i'll show you this i can almost prove it to you 
I, I've done very, very deep research on this. They are exactly what they were said to be. Even Venus was born from Jupiter. Velikovsky has all of this recorded from he went to every single culture on the face of the planet. They all had exactly the same story that Venus was born from the feared god Jupiter. And it came out of the red spot. And it spins backwards because it would be it would it, that would be the nature of its spin if if the spin of of Jupiter was the normal right hand spin, Venus coming out would spin left hand as it rotated away. And that's the only planet that spins left hand. Now, secondly, it was brilliant and hot, which it still is, it's 850 degrees even today. As it came towards the Earth, face of the planet. And in the seven days, it literally cooked the Earth because it was so brilliant and on the seventh day it impacted our atmosphere and it literally lit up the atmosphere now here's two things that happened one is that it was so hot that it just literally combusted the atmosphere but it also forced the hydrogens and the oxygens to combine into water, all right, from the pressure. You know how pressure works with condensation. Now, at that point, it came down as boiling water. So originally, it was recorded that everybody was jumping into the lakes and the rivers to try to get out of the heat. And they couldn't, and, and the lakes and the rivers were boiling. The oceans ended up literally boiling in some places. I don't think everywhere. Now, at that point, virtually all the giants died. And th that was what they wanted to do was get rid of the giants. And that was yeah. what it's all the, about. The, 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 the creation stories um, from ancient cultures are absolutely fascinating um, and important to study. And uh, the story of giants is unquestionable. The earth was covered in giants and all shapes and sizes. You know, some people think, oh, giants, they were this size. No, 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 no. They were, they were, <laughs> they were 12 feet giants. They were 15 feet giants. They were 10 meters. Giants, they were 40 meters. Giants, they were 100 meters. Giants, they were 300 meters. And giants, the big ones, from, from my perspective, the biggest ones that I've encountered were the ones that you refer to often are the, the Book of Enoch that are 3,000 hours tall. And, uh, and I think we're the big guys. For me, that's where it most likely stops because anything larger than that would sort of almost conflict with the size of the earth. Um, it's possible that there were bigger ones. It's possible there were bigger ones and there were bigger. Well, wait a minute. What do you think about the dragons? The, 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 oh, the, the giant, what they call the, that, that lies in North Africa that you described and all that. Those are much bigger than a mile high, obviously. So, you know, again, that's my limitation right now. That's where I sort of cut it off. I imagined that that's where the size of the giants probably stops, but I might be completely wrong. So I'm, I'm open-minded to everything and anything. The reason I say that, Roger, is because I have fossils. I have evidence of these large giants. I have bones of giants lying scattered among the stone circle ruins around me here that are 300 tons of a bone, a piece of bone, and it's got claw marks in it from and bite marks in it of some creature that was busy eating it when it was still a piece of meat. <laughs> so I know, I know, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's bizarre as hell, man. Yeah. And I have, I, I, I've been doing this a long time. I've been 12 years now, really deeply. And I had my DNA tests of my giants done in 2015. And I, I'll gladly show you those if you want to see them. And um, uh, I, I'm going to show you something here, and and then I'm going to I'm going to uh, I think. I want to ask you about your son. Whoops. Um, <clears throat> just to show you here, uh, these are just some images of um, of some of the rocks at Adam's calendar. It, it took me many years, obviously, to discover that Adam's calendar 
the stones and the, the stones that make up Adam's calendar itself are actually fossilized body parts. Michael, there's not a single rock that exists that was not biology. Every single rock that exists was biology at one point. Some yeah. of them have eroded and some of them have changed their structures due to the places where they were entombed in. If they were near kidneys, they were near salts. If they were near, near uh, uh, bile and acids and stomachs and so forth and blood, it's all, it's all, and I want to talk to you about your stone, sir. Uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. Because I'd like to know about those stones. What, what? Yeah. Sorry. I, I was trying to share my images with you. I think my computer is just so full. It doesn't even want to open the, the images. So. I could see yeah, I was running slow. Yeah. No big deal. Um. So, all right. So, <laughs> so Roger, I think what I'd like to, what I'd like to do is, is maybe we finish this and we pick up our, our next uh, conversation and we start with the fossils. Uh, the particle physics side is really, um, is really important because it gives us the, it gives us the, the ever expanding um, knowledge that we have and trying to understand the source of creation. I think we're probably getting a lot closer to it now than we were even a few years ago. Um, and the more I study it, and even like the photographs that you showed today uh, during our chat uh, sparked a few new thoughts and a few new ideas when you're talking about the, the single slit experiment and the, the laser beam and amplifying the laser and all these things, all that stuff keeps coming back to my comprehension of toroidal field. So it, it, it constantly expands that knowledge pool that allows me to think bigger and bigger thoughts. But one of my, I want to share with you one of my favorite creation stories um, and I wish I could find it again, because, you know, when you do research, sometimes you find something and, and you get so excited, you open it and you read it and then you forget it's there and then you close down and then you can't find it again. And it was one of those moments uh, that I'll forever. It happens to me every day, brother. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I haven't been able to find it since. Um, and this is ancient civilization. It talks about when God first created the earth. It was just like this giant uh, sand pit um, of just sand and water with the sand. And then he, then he created 144 giants on earth in the sand and water. And the giants went out like children on a beach, playing with the sand and playing in the water, making sand castles, pushing the sand together, allowing the water to flow, making mountains out of the sand, and letting the water flow from here to there and uh, creating oceans and rivers and lakes. And then once that was done, the giants had their fun. The giants died, fell over and became part of the landscape. 144 of these giants. And this is the creation story of this specific ancient civilization. I tell you what, that to me potentially is closer to any other story of creation of Earth than anything else, because ultimately it's water and silica, right? Between hydrogen, oxygen, and, and, and silica dioxide and, and sand, you've got everything else. And then the organic matter, the organic matter, which is the cells and the organic matter and the minerals that make up our bodies. Imagine 144 giants that are a mile high or even higher, falling oh, over, dying, all the rotting flesh, the rotting minerals and, and elements in their bodies filtering into the soil, the blood, the iron and everything else filtering into the soil and the oceans and the waters around them, mixing with everything. And then eventually it turns to stone. Out of that, those minerals comes the, the, the plants and the soil and the plants and the giant trees that then grow. And have the next cycle of creation of the giants that came afterwards that were smaller than the giant trees, obviously. So at one stage, it seems to me that the earth was completely populated by and covered like almost a giant forest. So large parts of the earth must have been covered by these giant trees that were 10 miles high, who knows, even higher uh, than that. And giants that were maybe a mile high they were lived un under these forests and in some areas it was open savanna and those are the days and the moments when those first 
parts of the earth was just the, sorry, the first epoch era of the earth. There was just these giants, these giant forests, mountains, savannas, grasses growing. And um, who knows how the animals got, got involved in all of this and where the animals came from. I have no conclusion of that yet. But this is just how I'm imagining this pristine, beautiful earth with these gigantic forests and gigantic trees and these giants. And then imagine a tree that's 10 miles high, what its leaves look like. And imagine the different types of trees. And then the sap that drips down, one drop of sap from one of those giant trees, what that would do if it lands on the surface. And then a giant leaf falls down and lands at the bottom and little branches and twigs break down and fall down. And suddenly you start this, this, this accumulation of organic matter of leaves and twigs and branches and tree sap and other stuff falling down, creating this huge layer of organic matter from the trees and the giant forest that then creates what, we, what today we see as the, the surface and the soil. And when you look at the cross-section of, of geology, wherever you look in the world, Cross-section when they build roads or mines or anything, when they chop down a, a side of a mountain, and you look at the cross-section of leaves and anatomy of body parts and anatomy of plants and trees, it's identical to the anatomy and the cross-section of mountains and rocks and, and savanna and deserts. It's identical. You can see giant parts. You can see cell structures. You can see tiny cells that could be blood cells. You can see the round things going in that could be arteries or intestine or, 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 or parts of leaves and plants. We're just looking at petrified cross-sections of a mixture of plant matter, trees, animals, giants. It's all together. <laughs> Uh, we have we have some we have a, a, a very very good site that we're working on right now out in um, Oregon. My friend Tyson Carlson, uh, Tyson's Mud Fossil Adventures. He's he, he and that that's just absolutely enormous giant. It's got membranes that in us you can see through. These are six feet thick, six feet thick, and. Um, I have I have so much on this, and I, I go down to the microscopic level, and I can show you that the pyramids were literally built upside down. <laughs> Those pyramids were the feet of giants, and they took blocks off because they they your tendons form in little tiny square blocks, thousands and thousands. Nobody's ever even seen them because they, you need to get into a micro micro microscopic is you can see the actual blood supply that fed down in there. There's black and there's, there's red. I mean, I, could, I have all this stuff yeah. I could show you. Anyway, so, at some point, I don't know when you want to do it, but yeah. I could show you at any time. We'll talk, we'll talk again soon, um, uh, and we'll do another long session. But the, the, the whole fossilization and fossils on Earth is unquestionably, unquestionably the big aha moment for me. When, when suddenly it became very, very clear to me um, that pretty much everything we look around us used to want at one stage be a living thing that turned to stone. Um, and I think- oh, I, want, I, want, I meant you to said that earlier, one, yeah. One other thing I want to tell you about, read Ovid, O-V-I-D. It's called Metamorphosis. All right, Metamorphosis. And he talks about the creation of the earth and all of these things. And he talks about the, what the gods did. And, and he, was, he wrote back right, at, about, right about Julius Caesar's time, just about zero AD, let's call it that. And, and um, he said that the gods could transform anything in anything that was called metamorphosis. And what they did was they created all kinds of creatures. And he says it, in the, it says in his opening statements, he points out specifically that the gods took giant creatures and turned them into landscape, normally by means of violence. <laughs> wow. 
that's and that's in now his book metamorphosis back then was as well read as the bible it was as, it was that it was an epic and i mean an epic you want to read this holy smokes i i've i've i'm aware i'm aware of that book uh, that information but i've not read it so i'm really keen to get my head into it when i get some time keep in mind that i'm so caught up in the one small town initiative right now that um it, it takes up 95 percent of my time and i try and find time in between to, to work on this stuff on the fossils and stone circles the research and so forth but um roger i think what, I, what i'd like to do is just um just leave it here for now and um and catch up with you again as soon as possible. And uh, let's talk about fossils. And hopefully, I'll clear my laptop so it's not so 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 bogged down with memory. And uh, so I can open some of my uh, my images and share with you because there's a lot of stuff you have not seen that I think you're gonna your jaw is gonna drop. Because I've yeah, I'd love to see them. Yeah, I'd love a lot to of see your them. stuff. And, and your, I want to you know about the stone circles. The stone circles interest me a lot. Yeah, look, the, the stone circle is very simple. The, 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 it's actually, it's a very simple thing, but we'll talk about that next time we catch up again. And you can ask me anything you want, because I think that's going to be very interesting for people to ha to listen to that conversation, because you obviously ask questions that maybe not have, have not been asked before, which is really important. More, the more questions we have, the more questions uh, I'm asked, the, the, the more information get, gets out there. And I have a vast amount of knowledge accumulated over 14 years about the stone circles. Well, let's, listen, listen, uh, let's, uh, let's um, end here today. It's excellent talking to you. Always love listening to you. And I love your, your mind and your insights and your, your background knowledge is really critical. Uh, so let's pick up again as soon as we can. And, and we'll pick up with the stone circles, the questions about the stone circles. Maybe we'll make that one, uh, one, um, one of our conversations and then we'll have another one and we'll talk about the fossils. So I can share some of the fossils with you that I've not shown you before, which I think you're going to be very excited about. Yeah, it, it, is, it is just amazing. And the key to the fossils is where if you're finding them in a location that, like I say before, is salty, is going to be one kind of condition, same kind of body part, but totally different if it was here or there. And the specific of this is... Um, Australia. Australia is just one big scab. It's just one big bloody scab. It's just <laughs> unbelievable. And they have the opals. And the reason opals form is because of transition metals. We'll get into all that again, brother. Exactly. Exactly. You just sparking my mind. We could just, you know, we could segue immediately into a deep discussion about all the stuff. But I'm, I'm itching to do that. But let's leave it here for now. Roger, thank yeah, you. I'm, I'm, I get the same itch, my friend. Yes. <laughs> I'll tell you, I haven't been able to talk to any human being for years. For years. So, People just don't want to hear it. They just don't want to hear it. No, no. But so, yeah. I, I, I appreciate your time, my friend. I really honestly do. And you don't, you don't know how much. Well, thank you. I appreciate yours. Roger, you have a great day. I'm going to log off here and go and um, make a cup of tea and relax for the night. And um, you have a great day because you're just starting where you are. And we'll talk very soon. All right. Make sure you get me a link to this. I'll put it up on my website, on my uh, channel too. A absolutely. All right. I love you, brother. Thanks, Roger. Bye. Ciao for now. Okay. Take care, my friend. Bye-bye.